Uh, number eight, in terms of this letter of intent, 8.1 is access. So the company is permitting the purchaser of its accountants as representative, which would be defined as counsel, accountants, auditors, insurance brokers, lenders, and all the other reasonable representatives of the purchaser. That could also be um, you know, independent tech consultants that might go and look at the software, if you will, to see if, if there's, you know, if, if the software is not tainted or if it's going to work or it doesn't have tons of flaws in it or what have you, or if it's using unlicensed software and it's going to be a problem. So th that would also be, you know, part of the, uh, a part of the team of representatives is defined in, in this section 8.1. And they're going to have access to the properties, books, and contracts and records of the company that are going to be furnished by the purchaser. And then the purchaser is allowing um, the representatives to uh, even talk to a customers, customers and vendors. But in that case, they want at least one officer of the, of the company to participate in the discussions. Uh, that's important because they still want to preserve their relationships with their vendors and their customers because this deal might not happen. I mean, that could, that could happen. And I think they're trying to be... be be safe with, with that, um, you know, with that uh, criteria to have one of their uh, officers participating in external discussions with their customers and vendors. And, um, but they're not going to talk to employees. That's very common because you don't want to spook your employees that, you know, the business might be for sale and, you know, uh, employees could get spooked um, and you don't want that to happen. So that's, that's a standard um, requirement. Here we get on to parties, expenses, that's important because it's being very upfront saying that um, each party is going to be responsible for their own fees and expenses. Counterparts, that's for simplicity, saying that two sides don't have to sign the same document. You sign your version, I sign my version, which is an identical copy. When you put the two together, you get a binding agreement as though you sign the same document. Uh, let's hop back up to exclusivity. This is typically where I see people fill in like their no shop requirements on the buy side, right? Yep. So this yeah, is pretty part. common. Um, you know, we, we expect that. We, we let our sellers know that, you know, when we're, when we're in an LOI with one buyer, it's a no shop. We're, um, you know, we're working with one person at a time. We're not out there, you know, continuing to shop the deal around and that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point, and that's where I mentioned earlier that um, in in some of those cases, um, some sellers will require that if I'm going to take my prop my my business my property up off the market, if you will, for a period of time, 30, 45 days, then I want to earn this money, and I've seen as as high as uh, like two hundred fifty thousand dollars for you know for for an acquisition where they want the money. That's the highest I've seen um, for earnest money to basically, but then it gets credited. Uh, for, for the closing if the deal goes through. But um, so it's really, it's an earnest money thing as well to show, uh, is this person serious? Because the non-binding letter of intent, I'm taking my property off the market. It might have a seasonal business and the numbers look great today, but they may be different in three months or 60 days. So um, now arbitration, I just want to clear up a couple of things about arbitration. Arbitration is not always the panacea that it sounds like. Um, because we've done some arbitrations that are literally just as complex and expensive and time consuming as a jury trial, um, because you are essentially having a trial. And you might have one arbitrator, you might have three arbitrators, depending upon the situation. Um, we had done one case with a very complicated copyright litigation, and it was on an acquisition of a business and we were fighting over copyrights. And there were three arbitrators, all heavy hitters. There was a corporate, a corporate person, there was a copyright expert, and there was a, uh, a contract expert. And each of the three uh, arbitrators had to be paid the full hourly rate, basically. And so essentially you had triple the hours of three senior partners and three New York, D.C. and Boston firms evaluating this, going through the whole thing. So essentially not a judge sitting there. There's, these were people that were on the clock in Turns out a couple of them were still having memorandum written by their associates and partners in their offices about some of the issues that we were touching on on the corporate contract and copyrights. And that was getting part of the, that was billed separately. So the, the legal fees were massive, just coming from the arbitrator. So just want to point that out there. Now, they were very sophisticated. It was a very complicated case. So that was the good news. Um, 
versus you know having a judge and a jury that may not be up on some of the copyright intricacies and software and things like that. So yeah, I just want to put in put that. So what you're doing here is you're saying if there's a dispute, you're going to go to one arbitrator, not three, one. Now what happens is both sides are going to argue over who do we want as the arbitrator. So you generally have a list. And you look at the bios of, the, of them and they'll say, we don't like these people. And then you say, we don't like those folks. And you end up negotiating to decide on who's the, the one arbitrator. Then, so you're both agreeing that any dispute will be a single arbitrator. There'll be no jury trial and it's binding arbitration. Now, what that means is if you don't like the results you got out of that single arbitrator, tough. You can't appeal it. So if there's a mistake in law, if they you know, they really missed it and they made a complete mistake in law. The arbitrator just missed, did, didn't understand the corporate issue, for example, it doesn't matter. It's binding. So that, it gives you finality, but there's a, there can be a downside as well because you have no recourse if there's a mistake. But overall, it, it'll give you certainty. You're going to go to one arbitrator. You're going to get in there quickly. You won't wait two years to have your thing heard. You know, your, your matter heard. You get a quick result. And it'll be inexpensive because you'll have one arbitrator and not three. And it'll give you some finality because nobody can go and appeal it just for the sport. Um, neither I, side. It, I was just going to say, I think it's, it's worth stating that, you know, it, it's not the goal of anybody, sellers, brokers, buyers, I hope, to, in, to enter and engage in litigious behavior. And uh, the, the, the goal is to find, a, you know, common ground, uh, assets that exchange hands, uh, and to consummate a transaction, uh, not to be, you know, chasing, you know, ambulance chasing, you know, lit, the, like creating litigious events uh, out of this. So we, we, you know, we at website closers are are fond of uh, great transparency, uh, bringing a tremendous amount of knowledge, you know, to the uh, to the transaction, so that we can peacefully uh, move through these transactions. We've uh, had very very few lawsuits. Um, and hope to keep it that way. So if you're the type of person that is trying to sue this person and that person and that person's done you wrong and you're going after this guy, you're going after that guy, please stop before you go anywhere and go somewhere else. Let's, let's find a good way of negotiating this through. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, I, I told clients that the worst way you can resolve, quote unquote, resolve a business dispute is putting it in the hands of somebody that doesn't know your business, it has no clue about business because they're not a bit, they're generally not business people. And you're gonna have that value where you're gonna flip a coin. It's very expensive, it's very time consuming, and there's a soft cost that's all, often overlooked. It is so disruptive because you have to get the documents, we have to do interrogatories, you need to answer 75, all these questions. And, you, and now you can't be, working with the sales and marketing people in your business to grow your business and managing employees and trying to grow your business. You're sitting there with lawyers saying, okay, question three, how do I answer that? I can't find the documents. We might have some stuff in archives. I'll look under an old laptop that I had that, you know, is, is, is in my basement that I've got to pull out. And it's a very bad way to resolve uh, an issue. And both sides never come out feeling whole um, generally, even the winner, because they'll, say, gee, that was expensive or that was a waste of time. And that, why did that take three, take so long, three years? So lousy way to, to, to resolve an issue. I, I totally think it's the, it's the wrong way. And I feel that if I have a matter that ends up in litigation, then I fail to basically get it done and negotiate a good res, a win-win for both, you know, for my client essentially, which is a win-win for everybody. If you can negotiate a walk away besides, you know, getting into litigation. Um, under 11, public disclosure, neither the company nor the purchase will make any disclosure uh, without the consent of the other party. That makes sense, unless required by law. What does that mean? It means that if, there's a, if, if you had a subpoena a, a, about this and you have to a, comply with a lawful subpoena, then obviously that's not a public disclosure. Uh, what's the legal effect? It's intended to be a statement of the mutual interest with respect to a possible transaction subject to the execution delivery of a mutually satisfactory purchase uh, satisfactory purchase agreement so again you have the general statement that you're not it's not binding it's got all these caveats 
the only thing binding is on the eight and 10. And let's go back at what is eight and 10. Eight and 10 is gonna be uh, access to information that you're giving that information uh, access. And if there's a dispute, you're gonna be in arbitration of a single arbitrator and nobody's gonna have a right to appeal. And that's it. And then confidentiality, you agree this, uh, that all of the uh, discussions contemplated are confidential uh, and subject to uh, the terms and conditions of any non-disclosure agreements executed by the parties. And you would have signed a non-disclosure agreement um, before you got to this point. Yep, there's no, there's no chance you got here without signing an NDA. Absolutely. So okay. that's, uh, that's the overview. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications about new videos and interviews. And introduce yourself in the comments. Are you a buyer or a seller?